Hey, man. You play for the Golden State Warriors? Is Steph Curry gonna come out right behind you? Um, uh, no. Just saying, bro, cause you're one tall brother. You sure you don't play? Uh, well, I used to do Peanuts League. Yeah, hey, look. I just flew in from South Central America. I need a place to crash for a while you game. Oh, well, I might be able to arrange something. You got much baggage? Nah. I just stole away on one of these planes. Man, all I got are these nachos. You know bears love nachos. Gee, I did not know that. I'm Jaime Tid, by the way. <clears throat> yeah, I got a name nobody uses around here. It's... Okay. Mind if I call you something uh, a little bit easier? Sure, hey. You wouldn't know how to use this body spray, would you? Isn't he so delightfully and whimsically clumsy? Oh! Oh, man! Wow, oh, being that clumsy sure calls for a special kind of name. I think I'll call you... Oakland International Airport. Or Oakland for short. Yeah, that's cool. <coughs> Paddington Bear is a creation of English book author Michael Bond who got the idea for the character after buying his wife a teddy bear for Christmas. Since they spent so much time with the bear at dinner, holidays, and other events, the bear pretty much became part of the family. So he wrote out a novel in 10 days which will later become known as A Bear Called Paddington. The story of a young bear from darkest Peru who shows up at Paddington Station in London looking for a home and ends up being adopted by the appropriate, generically named Brown family. Next thing you know, the English youth were all over this innocent little bear who had a knack for getting himself in trouble through his own childish ignorance and a very strong penchant towards a certain type of sugary preserve. Yeah, sounds totally unique, doesn't it? After a long span of book popularity, which is still going, my goodness, Paddington found a new audience on television through the 1976 series Paddington Bear, then later with the Hanna-Barbera series in 1989 and The Adventures of Paddington Bear in 1996. But the most recent screen outing for Paddington was 2014's Paddington the first attempt to bring the beloved bear into a live-action atmosphere. Incidentally, this one had Michael Bond a little worried seeing as he had no involvement with the production, aside from this little cameo, hello good sir, and saw that it got a PG rating for some rather mild elements, but he withdrew his concerns after seeing the film and said it was actually quite a charming little picture. I guess they think every kid's movie these days needs a few raunchy elements, just so long as that kid's movie is not attached to the name Charles M. Schultz. Still. Let's see just how nasty this one got. Where's he going to sleep? Uh, not in my room. He's a he. Tony's a he. Shut up. And Tony would be more than welcome to a bunk up. Well, as far as film adaptations distancing themselves from the spirit of the source material, could have been worse. Paddington on screen is still the same marmalade guzzling cute little fuzzy thing that nobody can seem to stay mad at any time he makes a mistake. Only here they got that aspect of his personality cranked up to about 11. The book's Paddington kept his clumsiness to a moderate and even somewhat believable level, much like a child who's prone to making mistakes out of their own curiosity. The film, however, has a propensity towards trying to make everything bigger, and that's why we suddenly have Paddington's fish-out-of-water behavior getting him into some pretty elaborate scrapes. The Brown family might have names in the book, but there's hardly distinguishing characteristics about them whatsoever that make them stand out, and that's what makes them so malleable to the reader is that they could just be any family, even your own. Just generically pleasant people. Of course, that's not good enough for a movie, which is why Jonathan likes rockets, Judy is boy happy, Mrs. Brown illustrates adventure novels, and Mr. Brown actually has a character arc. In desperate need for conflict, the film elects him to be a free spirit gone grouchy worry wart overnight who actually doesn't like Paddington, but still begrudgingly agrees to help him and in return ends up in funny situations like this. Hello! Hey, you'd be mad too if you had to dress up like the poor man's Mrs. Doubtfire. 
The only two other mentionable characters from the book series I can remember here are Mrs. Bird, the likably quirky housekeeper slash relative, and Mr. Curry, the always essential grouchy neighbor. But the strangest addition to the film's character mix is Nicole Kidman's character, Millicent. I don't know which of the screenwriters thought of this character because honestly, I don't think she belongs here. See, what gave the books their charm as well as the TV shows is that they were very basic and simple with their stories. Each situation was relatable to the kid reading it, and even the film keeps this innocent charm to a good degree. Sticking in a villain character who has a personal deep-seated vendetta against talking bears could work if it weren't for the fact that every time this character is on screen, it suddenly starts to feel like a spy thriller rather than a family film. And that is a pretty jarring change in tone. Or you never know, some kid in this generation might consider her for a future best scare of childhood. Yeah, there's some pretty standard nightmare fuel for your kids there, but that's not the worst this movie has to offer. Let's rewind a bit. Where did you take the bear? Winter Gardens. Thank you. I wouldn't go up the West Way this time of night, love. You want to go north? This movie just killed someone. Wow. You know... I may not have grown up with these books or the cartoon or anything, but I can still feel somebody else's childhood dying just a little bit there. Each Paddington adaptation thus far seems to pick and choose key moments from the book to adapt in order to keep the spirit of the story. The 76 Paddington is so by the book you could literally just skip the book altogether and just binge watch it. 89's Paddington does the honor of giving us the train meeting part of the story, the deal with the bathtub and other odds and ends with some liberties taken. And even though there are some out there who consider the 96 Paddington to be the best, it actually seems to borrow the least from the books as far as I can tell. But what makes them all work is how they maintain the story formula that the books had. Chapter by chapter, everything is its own self-contained story. Chapter 1, Paddington arrives. Chapter 2, he floods a bathtub. Chapter 3, he takes a trip to the subway and gets lost. Paddington destroys a painting. Paddington screws up a shop display. Paddington destroys a watch. Paddington screws up, screws up, screws up. You get the picture. Things are always happening to me. I'm that sort of bear. In an effort to try and be bigger and better, the film gives us an actual backstory on Paddington showing his family life in Peru before moving to England. Now complete with the biggest throwaway family movie trope of all, the dead relative. Goodbye, uncle, we hardly knew. I feel like a terrible person for saying this, but I was not affected by that scene, not in the least. And I feel like a terrible person for saying that because he's here, just, I've seen that cliche so many times, it could have been cut from the movie altogether, and I would have felt no different. I don't know, we'll see how I feel when I edit this thing. Once he arrives in England, he does end up with the Brown still, except now the aforementioned book stories that were once completely standalone now have to become part of a much larger narrative with Paddington on the search for an explorer that his aunt and uncle were friends with back in the day, and instead meets up with his daughter who's so cheesed off that her father didn't capture a talking bear and get rich off of it that she's willing to kill him for the prize money. Yeah, I didn't say the villain's motivation was all that good, did I? Still, the house flooding, subway shenanigans, and other nods to the book story here and there make for another main story point in which Mr. Brown is driven crazy to the point of driving Paddington out, which leads to the family guilting him into getting him back, leading into a big overblown rescue. You know, I'm starting to recognize this story here just a little bit. Family brings animal home, shenanigans ensue, drives dad crazy, animal gets removed, guilt trip, then finally ends off on a big climactic rescue scene. Am I watching Paddington here or Beethoven? And of course, this leads to Paddington getting rescued by way of Chekhov's marmalade sandwich, the villain gets her comeuppance, Paddington goes home with the Browns to live happily ever after, and hold a phone, what's that? Christmas? Wait, hang on a second.
Christmas, 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 Christmas. Oh. <laughs> Oh, right, gotta finish this. As I mentioned before, the books are completely episodic and that's why the TV shows work because even when they deviate from the book story, the formula is easy enough to copy over and over. We might have Paddington constantly screwing up, but each time it turns out okay because he either cleans up his mess or bumbles his way into doing someone else a favor in the process. That and I'm sure that it helps that he's oh so cute. He messes up a window display, it's okay because people stopped to watch the bear in the window and decided to shop there. He messes up a painting before an auction, it's okay because everyone loves the painting now. He runs over an old man in the street, it's okay because he had arthritis and now the wife gets to collect off of his life insurance. Okay, so I made that last one up, but it could have happened. Point is, it borderlines on creating an atmosphere with almost no consequences whatsoever. And that's what the movie is trying to fix. Keyword being trying. The last thing I notice about this film is how it feels the constant need to explain everything that did not need explaining to begin with. Part of the magic of the book came from not questioning the fantastic aspects of the story. How is it Peruvian bears no English and like marmalade? Ask no child who ever read the book. Simple, it was a British explorer. How is it no one is surprised to see a talking bear in England? Again, ask nobody. Well, you think the movie's implied answer is, hey, everyone should know about that whole talking bear expedition, right? Wrong. The movie shoots itself in the foot by explaining that said exposition was stricken from the records while this high society of explorers mocks the idea of intelligent bears. When you watch movies like, say, Disney's Robin Hood, you don't question the idea of humanoid talking animals because the universe itself does not call this into question. This movie does so an hour and 12 minutes in after a talking bear interacts with everyone in town and not a soul questions this. See the problem? I'm thinking too much about a movie that has a traveling mood minstrel band. Perhaps I'm the one doing too much questioning. All right, which one wins, book or movie? Scale of betterness. Yeah, basically after about a year's worth of giving it some thought and doing my book research, I, after seeing the film, I think the book wins just slightly, and you can stop looking at me like that because it's not going to change my opinion. Please stop. Thank you. Yeah, I never grew up reading these books. The first time I ever read one of them, I was actually babysitting. And it was a storybook edition that had much better artwork than this. Now having been given this opportunity to read more about it after the movie, I think I prefer its simple tone. This film was a good film. That's it. For what they were trying to do in bringing the book character to life, it's a very noble effort. The special effects are jaw-droppingly amazing. The comedy works most of the time, and it does try to go for this whole syrupy, sweet family mood. But the fault lies in the movie trying to overcomplicate things. I didn't even talk about that weird changing mood tree in the family's house. I guess it's trying to be symbolic. I just feel like it's trying too hard. And I appreciate kids' movies trying to be edgy, but the edgy moments here just feel off-kilter. It's like they needed a few scary moments for the halibut, even though that's not what the book was about. In the end, it's just a good movie. Book good? No. 98% on Rotten Tomatoes? Not in my book. Anyway, that's all for today. Don't forget to join me next time as I... Oh. You know what, I just realized something. Maybe with all my Christmas money, I should buy myself a new battery. <laughs> Merry Christmas and ciao for now. Left Peru and sailed to England alone. There he met the Browns and they took him home. Now a new life has begun. He's Windsor Gardens' favorite son. Cause he always does his best to help everyone. When a problem appears, he never misses a beat And always finds a way to land on his feet Has his very own unique point of view Looks at everything as if it's brand new He 
is friendly and polite And he tries to do things right But he gets in sticky messes just the same He's curious and speaks his mind But trouble's never far behind It's Paddington Bear, he's one of a kind I'm Paddington Bear Get a move on, dumb breath! It's not my breath! Ah! I hate Bernard! If you like what you saw here, please, please, please try to help support it. I have a Patreon page. You can help me by going over there, throwing some money, whatever amount that you like to throw in. If you're not watching this on YouTube, I also have a YouTube channel. So go there and hit that subscribe button to be notified whenever new videos and new content come out. I'm also on Facebook. Go over there and like that page so you can be notified as well whenever a new episode or video of some sort come out, as well as exclusive behind the scenes content. You can also hit me up on Twitter over there to see what uh, kind of stuff they like to share. Just be warned though, I don't like getting too many messages. So if you're constantly sending me stuff all the time, I can get really agitated. Remember, my privacy is golden. And if you like my t-shirt, I got a t-shirt store over there too. I got links, I got fresh designs, I got new stuff coming out over there. Provided, of course, that anything actually sells. That's about it. If you like what I do, hit that like button, Facebook me, tweet me, share me on your little social networking sites, do whatever you gotta do. Email me to all your little friends, and that's all I gotta say. Thank you, and peace!